love to welcome everybody. I'm sure you, this is not the first time you've been welcomed today, but it's the first time I've gotten to welcome any of you today to the NOW Conference 2018. And I am honestly thrilled to get to present here. It's about something that I really love, which is coaching and connection. And so I'm thrilled to be able to share that with you all today. If I'm not mic'd up, can you all hear me in the back? I tend to be so super loud that I avoid it, but just in case, I want to make sure. So I know that the theme of this year's conference is around sustainability. And I love the word sustainability because it's a buzzword. It's really catchy right now. But it actually has some deep meaning for me in a couple of ways. Number one, it represents to me mindfulness. To be sustainable, one has to be mindful and present. And two, it's about developing yourself. So these two concepts I've really smashed together into kind of one big entity so that I have an ability to stay attuned to what's going on around me. And I do that so that I can be encouraging myself to grow as both an employee and as a human being. So my goals around sustainability are to deeply enhance my personal connections. What I'm trying to do is widen my community base. And I want to do this so that I ensure that I have an enduring network of people, friends, work colleagues, that help me when I'm trying to achieve both my career goals and my personal goals. Now, what I consider doing this is basically sustaining my own relevancy, making sure that I am a creative, a resourceful, and a whole person in any avenue of my life. OK, but this is hard to do. And I've struggled with it as my days now have become less about what I want to do and more what I must to do. And I have found that I don't get to take the time that I would want to to slow down, to be present, and to really sort of see what's going on in the world around me in order to connect with people and the things that I love. So it's this journey of trying to find my own way to sustain connection, to sustain relevancy, that brought me here today as a speaker. So for those of you that don't know me, hello. My name is Cara Lynn Jovanello, and I am the department manager for the amazing astronomy department on campus. If anybody's near Campbell, come up and say hello. It's a beautiful new building. And my side job, um, because I do live in the Bay Area, is I'm also a certified professional and personal coach. And what I do is work with both national and global clients about reconnecting to their lives, about working within their life purpose, and finding some joy in the everyday. Now, if I combine my experiences that I've had at UC Berkeley, along with my coach training, what I've pulled out are very easy tools that every person in this room can take away today and use as soon as they leave. And what I want to do is remind you that these things of growing, of being sustainable, of being relevant, what they are are processes that we have to practice, that we have to consistently keep our focus around and on in order to steer us back if sometimes we've just veered too far away from um, those things that we hold dear, whether it's at work or whether it's at home. I think it's really important to understand how we've disconnected so that we can kind of have a roadmap of what we maybe want to avoid in order to get back to connection. So I believe that every single person in this room, whether openly or secretly, has a story that asks, do I belong? Am I good enough? Am I a part of things? Our experience of separation and the fear of not being belonged to this world, it's universal. And it affects us in every area of our lives. Now, this separateness can affect our professional's career. Some of you may have said to yourself at some point, I'm not good enough at my job. I want to be better. Or looked at someone else growing in their career and said, I want what they have. How do they have that position and I don't? You may have asked these questions in your personal life. I want what that family has. I want to be wealthier, happier, have more free time, play with my kids more, like my kids more. <laughs> now, these questions that we're asking ourselves, what they have is a profound effect and an impact on how we see ourselves out in the world. 
What it does is it opens a window enough to let our insecurities and inadequacies start to creep through. Now suddenly we have these words of doubt. We've got fear. We've got loneliness. And they've crept inside our inner space, into our inner peace. They've unsettled us. We get these painful sensations sometimes simply from logging onto Facebook, from scrolling through our Instagram accounts. Why are they at the beach and I'm not? Going through your snaps. Oh, I wish I could delete that before I even saw it. Basically what's happening is that we are having this influx of information on a daily basis, sometimes an hourly basis. And what it's doing is it's forcing us to dramatically reflect on our own lives. And sometimes it brings forth these insecurities and inadequacies we weren't even sure that we had. So this path of doubt that we're all walking, what I call is dancing with my saboteur. That's a coaching term. If you've ever heard the word inner critic, they're the same thing. Anyone familiar with saboteur, inner critic? OK. So welcome to it today. I bring this saboteur concept up because all of us have it. We're born with it. And what it does is it's a group of thought processes and feelings that want us to desperately maintain the status quo. They like what you're doing right now, the saboteur. Your inner critic thinks, don't try for that promotion. Don't go on that trip. Things are good the way they are. And sometimes your saboteur is so savvy, it's so sexy and good, you don't even know that it's telling you not to do something. You think it's trying to protect you. So this concept, it keeps us feeling inadequate. It keeps us down. And what it's doing is creating this wedge, right, between you knowing yourself and now you doubting yourself. But the saboteur, again, it's always with us. You can't get rid of it. It's not bad. It's not good. It's just what is as part of us being human beings. But how we choose to respond to our inner critic, to our saboteur, that determines the strength of the connection that we first want to have with ourselves. That's the first connection we want to try to reestablish. Because if we know what we value, if we know how we really want to live our lives through our own life purpose, what that does is it creates resonance, creates that energy. It creates connection. But when we've lost that, what we've done is we've created that rift, right? We've stopped listening to ourselves. Do we know what we want? Do we know what our desires are? Do we have connection with where that's going? In essence, we've become two separate people. So it's heartbreakingly common for us to feel separate from ourselves. Um, we don't fully know our own passions. We don't know our own preferences. And now we're living lives out of sync. Does anyone feel brave enough to say that's how sometimes life feels for you? Because I know that's how life feels for me. In fact, a recent study um, found that human beings find this unease, and they call it existential angst. That's a scientific term for you to take home. And what's interesting to me is that the same area of the brain where you see this existential angst, it's the same as physical pain and the pain of social rejections. So with the onslaught of technology, you may have this existential angst if you're not getting enough likes on your post, if you're not getting enough shares or comments or reposts, if there's no traction to your social media site. And let me tell you, it is painful and it is distressing when you ponder the meaning or sometimes the meaninglessness that you fear is actually inherent in your lives. So I would say most of us as human beings we generally avoid it. We want to move away from that pain, from that feeling of confusion. So we compartmentalize what we want and what we need. And in doing so, again, we don't know who we are. We don't know our core. We don't know what makes us unique and special. So through this deflection, what have we learned to do? Well, I'm going to look outside of myself now to see how I should behave, how I should act. We do this because we're trying to ease the unknowing. It's that continued separation. And truly, we don't like it. That's why we fight with it. That's why we try to argue with the saboteur. So I want to widen our perspective a little bit, because I'm sure people are saying, well, how did it get here? How did we get here? My husband is a middle school public school teacher. 
and he informed me that the public school system that we have today is actually set up to create workers to fit immediately into systems that we have presently today. So these systems, which are your working environment, social norms, these are um, begging for people who will sit quietly in their chairs, that won't ask too many questions, that won't disrupt that status quo. And through this experience, then what are we taught? We're taught at an early age how to behave to be systemized, how to react to be systemized, and how to respond. So basically, we're disconnecting from everything that makes us feel unique, everything that makes us unique, in order to be sustainable in getting and keeping a job, in getting and making friends, in having the relationship that we want. So then we're trying to take up less space in the world. We're apologizing consistently for who we are and the way that we act. What we're doing is betraying our own truth and completely abandoning our own selves. To do this, we actually have to shut ourselves down in shame. We are afraid that who we are is not good enough, that we are not right, that we are not normal. Brene Brown, who is an author, a research professor, a PhD, she has said, when we are feeling shamed, the camera is zoomed in tight, and all we see is our flawed selves, alone and struggling. We think to ourselves, I'm the only one. Something is wrong with me. She continues by saying, I define shame as an intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Something that we have done, experienced, or failed to do has made us unworthy of connection. And that, my friends, is how the saboteur has found its way in through that little crack in the window and how technology today is causing us to have that rift. So now we only feel this deep separation with ourselves, which is immensely saddening to me. But now we're also feeling it both personally and professionally, even globally. If we look at current events happening right now, we've seen a domino effect of citizens having to disengage, disconnect, and disassociate from this onslaught that we are having of distressing, deeply disheartening information. And technology is now moving faster and faster, so fast we can't even keep up. And we have these methods of communication that are bridging confident, uh, con confidence, that are bridging continents, and they're transferring data, and they're sending great pictures of my two kids to everyone that I want to see. But what it's doing is taking away that feeling I have of community. I use the word community because I believe it is an extremely strong puzzle piece in the sustainability puzzle. And when we move away from the concept of sustainability of community, connection suffers. So the original idea, as I'm sure you guys know, that the internet was made to connect us. It was made to bring an internet community together. And yet all the words that I'm hearing now when we're on the internet are fake news, manufactured lives, and generally being disconnected with other people and what they have, what we don't have. So professionally, we start to manage from afar. We have Zoom meetings, we have blue jeans, I don't even know what the hip terms are these days, but we think that we're doing such a great idea and job by connecting with people that live far away, but we're not actually being more productive and we're not actually having connection with the person on the other end of that video call. If personally, it seems to me that we have forgotten that there are human beings on the other side of the posts that they make on social media and that we literally cannot hear people anymore over, over this roar of information overload. So we have articles written consistently about how we are less humanly connected the more that technology is advancing. And yet when we do connect with people, yay! What we're actually doing is sort of a pre-sort of what we went through in the day. You're going through your list of to-do items. This happens to me all the time at dinner in my house. I did this today. I went there. I saw this person. I checked these things off my to-do list. We call it catching up. Hey, let's catch up. Let's meet for happy hour. Let's talk about something. But what we're really doing is just kind of bulldozing through what we did in the day. 
And we're not actually following something that's a connection. We're following something that says, let's keep getting down to business, right? Let's even be in our friendships, getting down to business. So in this small amount of time that you can actually connect with someone, whether at work or at home, you have to ask, how much are we actually communicating, let alone connecting? Is it at all? Because to me, deep connection, it brings us beyond the story. It brings us beyond the details of our lives. It requires us to stop and realize that there is a unique human being that needs to be known and understood. Each of you are a unique human being to be known and understood. If we could only remember how, how to connect. We've become sophisticated and we've moved into this increasingly global society. We have all ways to interact, but very few to connect. So today I would like to share with you a couple of tools that I have found that really go across the bridge of being technology, technologically savvy and trying to find a way through reestablishing connection and slowing down and going back to basics. So in my coaching certification, I actually thought to myself, I have found the secret path back to connection. I told myself this thinking I was the only one. For 18 months, I took these classes with these world-renowned instructors, and I had all of these different students in all the different classes, but what I was most blown away by was the connections that I formed on day one that were so deep and so quick, it actually caused me to pause and ask the question, why? Why was this experience so different to the ones that I was having in my everyday life? Why, when I was in these courses, did I find that every single person I could connect with, no matter any sort of their social status, their gender, any piece that kept us different, I was connected to them. Why couldn't I do this at work? Why can't I do this at home? What made this environment so special? Well, it was just two tools. Two tools that I found were really helpful. And it were these that created immediate and that definitive connection. But honestly, they were so obvious when they were talking about them that I felt ridiculous paying a lot of money and studying for a lot of time on how to master these two skills. And yet when I did, when I invested the time to do it, they literally changed everything. So the two skills we're gonna work on today are active listening and powerful questions. You guys ready? Okay, so I want each of you right now just to think, scroll through your Rolodex of memories to a time when you talked to someone who was so present with you that it unnerved you. It was a little bit creepy in their intensity. Okay, there's got to be someone that you have had this interaction with. Someone whose full attention was locked so much so on you that their focus was completely yours. And it made you feel like you were the only person in the world. You felt seen, you felt heard, and that moment was wonderful and unsettling. And yet you felt connection, you felt relevant. Well, if you do have an experience with a person that made you feel that way, you were in the presence of a wonderful active listener. Now, listening is a skill that seems super easy. Again, I'm talking about basics here, and yet we do not do it well. Most people think that they're great listeners, and they'll probably tell you. However, they're not. And the reason is we're starving for it on such a daily basis that we're rushing through the process when we don't even know how to stop and slow down. We want people to listen to us. We want them to know what we're actually saying, what we're actually feeling, to be interested in us past the surface stuff, past the catching up. So we have to ask ourselves then, why is listening so important? I think it's because people open up when they feel listened to. I think that it allows for them to feel safety and therefore they want to extend an olive branch of trust to me. We're slowing down the communication between that person and myself, and in doing so, I'm allowed to get a deeper understanding of who they are as a person, 
How do they think? How do you think differently than somebody else? Well, that sounds awesome to me. So then my second question is, why aren't we doing it? Well, we're under pressure, boy. Joked about the Bay Area, but we live in an environment that is hustle, 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 pressure, pressure, pressure. And we have to listen to just a minimum of what we need to in order to quickly fight that first fire. So what can we do? Turn around to fight the next one. It is so hard to be present in this moment that we prefer to just not do it. I get it. I was there. Two years ago, I probably would have said I was a great listener and just Never heard anything that anybody was saying. Thought my husband was going to be here today, and I'm glad he's not because I did this to him all of the time. <laughs> so then what is the consequence of not listening? Well, the first one is that everybody's going to be talking. It's really loud when everybody's talking. And there is a lack of engagement that happens when no one is listening and everyone is speaking. And then the connection that we're so desperately searching for is broken because this has become a one-way relationship. Okay, so then how do we listen? So listening is one of the primary coaching contexts. And in fact, coaching happens at a very particular style of listening. And I wanna just give credit to the coactive model, which is from the Coaches Training Institute, brand name, copyright. Um, but what they have done is they've provided three levels of listening that we can actually see the deepening to connection through it. The first is internal listening, that's level one. Level two is focused listening, and level three is global listening. So let's talk about level one. Level one I like to refer to as listening to me. Now what this means is you're noticing everything that's going on in a conversation that's about you. What's happening is that you're asking yourself, how is this conversation affecting me? What thoughts or feelings am I have as I'm having this conversation? What opinions or reactions are am I being provoked to say? What am I chomping at the bit to say next? Wow, that's a lot of I, 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 me, me, me in a conversation. It might even have more random thoughts of what you would like for dinner tonight, or man, I really am tired, I need to go grab a cup of coffee. What it means is, you're absorbed in level one, which is thinking about what you think, see, hear, and feel. So I'm just gonna throw it out there that these type of exchanges, they're not super powerful for the other person, just in case you weren't in the know. Um, it may be powerful for you in that conversation because you're all about you, but this is the kind of listening that is one way, one direction. And the other person is probably gonna leave pretty frustrated and pretty disappointed because they have been neither seen nor hurt. Has anyone ever felt like they've been in a conversation where they were not actually a part of it? And you know, right? You know the second that that other person is completely disconnected from you. You feel it, let alone can see it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Great, great, great. Oh, wonderful. It looks like our time is up. Thank you so much for stopping by. Now, however, I do want to throw out a little caveat about why level one is a thing. Level one is great for the me because what it's doing is building awareness about yourself and it's helping you avoid reaction without forethought. So if situations or something triggers you, you're able to have a conversation with yourself before you react about it, which is not a bad thing. But if you're trying to get past level one listening, you have to remember that listening is a skill which is a muscle and you have to practice it and you have to strengthen it even though we do it every day. It's something that you have to check in with yourself about, otherwise you will go back to listening in this level one again and again and again. So I actually have a suggestion that I've used for myself and I've given to a lot of clients. If you know that you are a level one speaker and I will not ask you to call yourself out, I see you, write a one on your hand. And when you're going into that big meeting or you're a supervisor and you have to talk to someone about a situation that's not going well, you're a parent of a horrible, I mean a wonderful toddler, you may want to put that one back on your hand so that it redirects you when you look down and see it. So that it reminds you that you're thinking about yourself and not the other person and you can let it move you down the path to level two. So level two, I call this listening to you. So level two involves focusing your full attention 100% now on the other person. What a shift, right? 
Level one's all about you. Now level two is all about them. What you're doing is you're shining a single spotlight of attention so completely on the other person that they're truly the only thing that you see. I like to refer to this as meticulous awareness of what the other person is saying and noticing as well all their nonverbal cues. There are many levels of communication. Words are not just one of them. You might wanna see their facial expressions. You might wanna see how they're holding their body. You might wanna check out how they're breathing. Are they checking their watch? Are they looking at the clock? It's this skill of being fully absorbed by the person in front of you, which excludes everything, including level one. Now that doesn't mean that your level one thoughts aren't gonna try to weasel their way back in there. Someone said something and you're immediately triggered and you wanna respond, or you've started thinking through that story that's in relation to what they're telling you. But you have to manage those level one thoughts. You have to snap back into the conversation with the other person. So you acknowledge that it happened and then you quietly shift those thoughts aside and you get back into focus with the person. So if you've ever been to a meeting at work, we all have a fishbowl in one of our buildings and you've seen two people sitting there and they are completely engaged with the other. Right now they're in level two listening. And what that means is they have the ability to have a conversation and use the catchphrase, which is a level two catchphrase. This is what I heard you saying is that right? Could you imagine having a conversation where somebody just asked, hey, I heard this, is that what you mean? What this is, is a very present kind of listening, right? You're absolutely where the other person is, so much so that you're recounting their words almost verbatim. You're never thinking ahead of what to say next, and you're not planning on what you need to ask to keep the conversation going. You are in a present moment, and you are trusting that this conversation, it's gonna start to take on of a flow of its own, right? It's gonna have its own rhythm because it's now between you and the other person totally. So it requires a little faith. It requires the faith that you think you're gonna have something to say when it's your turn, which can sometimes be very scary, very vulnerable. Two, it's about having some humility. You need to let go of the idea that you need to that you need to look or to sound any specific way that you think you want to come across. And three, it's again practice. So these elements, when you use them together, they start to create that bridge to connection. And now you're heading to the golden spot. You're heading to level three. So level three is called listening to us. You, me, us. So has anyone ever walked into the room before anyone has said something to them, they know it's gonna be awesome. They just get a good vibe from walking into somewhere. What about the opposite? Have you ever walked into a room and thought, this is gonna be the worst thing that's ever happened? But no one's even said anything to you, let alone looking at you. There's also the idea of love at first sight, right? How do we explain something like this? Well, I think it's level three listening. And it's the practice of noticing what's happening now, not just with you and the other person, but in the space of the whole area. You're basically noticing what's the vibe of the conversation. Are people speaking loudly and animatedly and yay, they're all smiling. Or is everybody muttering to themselves, checking on their phones, looking at the clock already. You can tell immediately what's going on in the area around you if you widen your gaze, if you open your eyes and your gut, your instinct to reading the room. So you need to find out when you walk into something, can you articulate what's happening? Is there tension? Has anyone ever walked into a room when a couple is having a fight and they both turn to you and you're like, wow, I smell that tension? <laughs> or is the conversation that you're having with someone really flat and no one seems to be engaged in it even though everyone's like, yay, I'm glad that we're here having this conversation. You have to ask, what's hanging out in the space between us, around us? And is it okay for me to say, hey, I see that smell that want to talk about it? Because this is your intuition talking. This is your intuition, something that makes you a unique human being, your intuition. And what it does is it allows you to address the energy that's in a room, and it can be perceived before any words have ever been spoken. So I have said that during my career here at UC Berkeley, this level of listening, level three, even before I knew what it was, is the piece that has served me so advantageously. 
And I've had, I think, four jobs in about six years since I've been here. And each of these jobs surfaced when I gave myself over to listening to my intuition. When I really heard what somebody was saying or what the campus was saying or what was going on around me. And then I trusted myself to explore something new. I moved with confidence within my community when an opportunity came up because I trusted my gut to tell me so. So I can say with certainty that I wouldn't be where I am at Berkeley right now if I hadn't, one, paid attention to my intuition, and two, didn't rely on my solid connections with my com campus colleagues. I needed them. Because of these connections, I was in a loop. I was in some loop, I'm not sure which loop, but I was in a loop. And I was informed and I was relevant when a job posting came up to be able to go forward and to apply for that position with confidence. Sometimes I wiggled through a career at Berkeley when I didn't think that there was one open for me. So I believe that every person that's in this room has a skill set to be successful in their job. In fact, that's why I think Berkeley hired you, because they see that skill set. But how well you perform at your job is most likely based on how well you have trusted your intuition and built relationships within your work community. Because it's connections to the people that are around you that create that safe, supportive environment, which is really what we wish for, whether we're at work or at home. But in order to get to this place of solid connection, you need to use that level three listening in combination with one more super basic thing that we use every day, to go really deep into the conversation, and that's in the form of a powerful question. So powerful questions are provocative inquiries, and they shut down the two things of evasion and confusion. When you ask a powerful question, what you're doing is inviting the other person to clarity on their own, to action on their own, to a communal discovery at a way, way deeper level. And when they're able to give you responses that are openly honest and accountable, what it's doing is showing a vulnerability. It's showing a trust level that can only be created when someone trusts you. That to me says connection. And this new level that we transcend, it goes past all that surface stuff that we were talking about earlier. What it does is it pushes ourselves toward introspection. We want to discover solutions. We want to lead our conversations toward things that bring creativity and insight, bring some energy. Have you been in that meeting where you just wished there was a little bit more energy, a little bit more engagement? So then how are we not doing this already? OK, back to grade school. <laughs> so what we were trained to do is we were trained to get information by asking specific questions. And those specific questions would enable us to deduce answers. So in that environment, we learned specific questions get specific answers. Yay, we're right. We're fitting into the system. But when you're seeking information, when you're basing it on an assumption that you have, you're basically shifting back to that level one, right? You're basically already asking a question that you know the answer to. You're not getting new information. You're keeping your ear to the piece of information that you're hoping you're gonna pull out and then you go, I found it, everybody, I found it, I was looking for it and there it was. It takes away from your natural interest and curiosity to ask a question where you already know the answer. Suddenly we're now chose, choosing to ask the right questions, the correct questions. But like listening, powerful questioning and how you do it well, it's a talent that you have to practice. And the first level of support that you can lean on when you're really trying to get good, powerful questions is simply curiosity. So I've been an educator for my previous career outside of Berkeley, and I found that the essential nature of curiosity is in young children. Does anyone have children in here besides me? Okay. So you probably already know where I'm going with this. But they have simple questions that they ask over and over. What is it? Why? How? When? And if you hear these enough, you're probably going bonkers because you hear them ad nauseum if you're a teacher or you're a parent or you're an aunt and uncle. But it's this childlike quality of energy and aliveness that comes to their curiosity and it's infectious. 
So one of my CTI instructors, Susan Moss, said, curiosity presents a paradox. It is wonderful quality of playfulness, and yet in practice, it's a powerful way of opening doors that have been closed and locked and forgotten. So I see this quality now as a parent every day. I have two kids, and I'm generally delighted when I let myself go to see where the conversations with my eldest, who's a toddler, she's three and a half, go, because there's no template for what we're trying to talk about. With, there's nothing that we have to follow. Um, Evelyn, my daughter, has taught me the mastery of creativity and curiosity, because she doesn't know any other way to be. She's trying to figure out how things work. She's trying to figure out how people feel, why they think the way they think. And then you can watch her put it all together to figure out how it makes sense for her. I'm actually watching her grow and develop as we have very open-ended conversations. And it's really because of her incredible skill of curiosity. So the first step, though, in trying to get yourself to a place of asking powerful questions is awareness around curiosity. We're so accustomed to feeling like, again, we have to know the answer before we've asked the question, that sometimes we actually find it impossible to ask the question without knowing the answer, so we don't ask anything at all. But to build connection, back to that connection, we have to be present. We need to use our level three listening, and we need to ask follow-up questions out of sheer curiosity. And yet, this other application of curiosity is, again, noticing that energy. We're back to level three. What's our intuition saying? If you sense hesitation on someone's part when you're having a conversation, ask them about it. If you're hearing happiness or frustration or sadness or joy, be curious about it. You can use these clues as signals to pursue your curiosity and to flip on that switch of intuition. It's awesome. It lights up a room. It lights up a conversation. Now, if you think about it in everyday life, if somebody's trying to communicate with you and it's in direct conflict with your intuition, you have to assume that that person is not safe or feels ready to address the topic head on. But they are actually already doing it, aren't they? Because you're reading the signals of them tapping their foot, of them smiling, of them using your hands, these nonverbal cues. And they want you to know what it is they're saying, but sometimes they're just not ready to say it out loud. So this is the place where you can cue your curiosity to just charge forward. So try the phrase, hey, I heard you're saying this, but I'm picking up something different. What am I missing? When you ask that question, two things are generally going to happen. The first one is the person didn't even know what they were talking about. They were just going on and on and on. But you heard it, and you grabbed it, and you pulled it out of the conversation, and you asked them about it. They may say, whoa, I didn't even know I was saying that. But now that you've brought it to my attention, it's true, and I actually want to blah, 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 blah. What you're doing is you're letting that person know that you were right with them, right? You were in the present. You heard it. You sensed it. You felt it. You called something out because of your intuition. There could be the other thing where the person says, actually, no, that's not what I'm feeling. I'm actually feeling this. And they'll continue to talk to you because you've just paved the way for them to continue with their thought process. You've asked them to deepen the meaning for themselves. They're present with you. There is this huge difference that we have to come to terms with between conventional questions that are trying to elicit information and curious questions that evoke personal exploration. Now, sometimes the most powerful questions are the ones that sound the most simple. This, again, comes back to paying for a coaching course and them telling you the most powerful questions and you going, seriously? Seriously? OK, so what these do is they slide under the radar. They, they catch the other person off guard because they're so basic. They're so simple. They're so clean in their execution. How about what's next? That is a great, powerful question. What about this is important to you? Ooh, I like it. What else? What did you learn? And one of my favorites, because I'm a bit of a scab picker, is why not? 
So take 30 seconds right now. If you have a piece of paper, feel free to jot one down. But think of the most powerful question that someone has ever asked you or you have ever asked another person. And when you have written it down, take a good look at it and ask yourself, why was this so powerful? Now, if you don't have one or you're going blank, feel free to peek over on your neighbor's paper because no one owns a good question, FYI. We can all have a powerful question and use the same one over and over. But the reason that these short questions are so powerful is that they're not asking for explanations or rationalizations, OK? You're asking for the person to be present in this moment with the conversation that they are having and speak to what is true in their lives and what is honest for them. But listen, this is a desperately scary place to be. And it makes you very vulnerable. And yet, when you can give yourself over to vulnerability, when you can give yourself over to connection, it lets you have the freedom to be real. And that transcends fear straight back to connection with yourself and connection with the world around you. So these are conversations that each person wants to continue, right? They want to be present for. And it's digging deeper to build connection to community to sustainability. So when attention is truly being paid through active listening and through genuine curiosity, one's authentic self shines through. You shine through. And in all that brightness that you have, all that heat that you explore, people can see you from behind the technology. They can see your vulnerability and they want to provide for you a safe place to continue the passage of connection. Now, intentional listening are three levels of listening. They grow our consciousness, right? They allow us to expand our world. And when, bless you, and when we are truly listening to each other, we're able to make our own world grow by learning about other people and what makes them tick, what makes them interested, what makes them present. Now we're able to move from connection, again, to community, again, to sustainability. Purposeful questioning allows for intuitive listening to carry curiosity forward and to deepen a connection that can sometimes develop into a marriage, into a promotion, into a best friendship. Now, you can learn about the other person by using these two techniques, and that person can be on the other side of the phone. They can be on the other side of the table. They can be on the other side of a keyboard. And these aren't excuses for you to use. I can't see them. I don't know what they're saying. I don't know what they're thinking and feeling. That's an excuse. And if you use these two tools and you are present within the conversation, connection will grow. So I want each of you to try when you leave today to integrate these simple techniques into the different facets of your life. Try at home if it feels safer. Try work because it doesn't feel so close to you. But pay attention to what happens when you are trying to create a connection and then what it takes for you to sustain it, to keep it strong. So I ask each of you, why would you settle for half a presence, half of a connection, half of a human experience when truly so much more is available? What I see is the only argument is that it's hard. <laughs> if it were easy, everybody would be integrating connection into their life all the time. Everybody would be communicating on this deeper level. And we would all be in a community that was so awesome we'd never want to leave it. But human beings are complex and they are multifaceted. And relationships and organizations are even more so. And societies are the most of all. The world is becoming increasingly complicated and challenging and paradoxical. And yet to combat these challenges, we want to become more sophisticated in the way that we both think and react. We want to do this to move more effectively, more smoothly, more directly to our goals, to the goals of our organization, to our life purpose. Now you can start today by having a truly wonderful conversation with these two techniques that we've learned, but you can begin connecting immediately. So if there's any more information that I can provide for you, I would be happy to. You can um, post me a little link on my webpage, clgcoaching.com. 
There are evaluations that they have asked us to ask you to fill out. But mostly, thank you guys so much for being present here with me today. And have a wonderful rest of the uh, now conference 2018. Thank you.